Ever since the discovery of over 200 children's remains at a Kamloops residential school has gone public, authorities and political figures have made it a priority. But my next guest has been trying to get leaders to take action on this subject for years. Kevin Annett spent decades trying to shine a light on the atrocities of residential schools, but no one would listen. He has a podcast and has written a book on the topic. He joined me once again earlier this week to discuss some new developments. In your most recent broadcast, you talked about the Canadian Genocide Tribunal being set up. Can you tell us about this and what the goal is? Well, really, we're following international law, which says when a country admits to or is proven to commit, have committed genocide, the world community is obligated to prosecute and punish. And those are the two words in the UN Convention on Genocide, prosecute and punish. And what it says is when the government is not willing to conduct a, a credible investigation, uh, then it's up to the citizens and to the world community. So in effect, what we've done is we're standing on that. We're actually following through on the original tribunal that was set up in 2012, 2013, that brought in a judgment already against the Crown of England, the Vatican, the various churches in Canada and the government that ran these schools, which found that they not only planned and uh, carried out genocide, but they then tried to cover it up. And we're witnessing the same kind of cover up, which under the law is as serious as the crime itself. Who exactly is involved in how can this tribunal be used to bring justice and hold responsible the parties accountable? Well, it involves a number of people who we've worked with for over 10 years now, including retired judges in, uh, in Europe including a uh, retired Spanish judge, Beltazar Garzon, who was the, the judge who tried to bring criminal charges against General Pinochet in Chile. Um, it also involves many indigenous activists and Canadian citizens and advisors in America who have a longer tradition of, um, you know, relying on common law uh, grand juries to investigate crimes of, of the government itself. So we're using all of those people to try to generate another pole of attraction in Canada away from the official government inquiry, which is really like the serial killer, you know, appointing his own judge and jury. How do you think that this will be able to hold those parties accountable? Under international law, we have the right to get uh, a warrant to go into areas, conduct credible uh, professional investigations and analysis of the remains. We're not having anything come out of the present Kamloops dig. Insiders in the Kamloops Band Council tell us that the RCMP, the BC coroner, and a few people on the band council are basically huddling and not letting out any information, which is really against the law for them to be doing that. The, the RCMP that rounded up children and, and tracked down the runaways are now really tampering with their own crime scene. And that's, uh, that's a no-no under any, <laughs> under any legal system. As you have discussed, Canadian authorities have known about these deaths for over a hundred years. So why do you feel this discovery in Kamloops has been made public and is coming out now? The practical reason is uh, it, it was on, I believe, uh, May 27th, a member of the, the Kamloops Band Council leaked the news of the, the mass gravesite in the planned dig to the local Kamloops media. And then it spilled out that way uh, because the Band Council did not want to release any information about what they were doing with that grave. Uh, also, there's been a whole, over the last year or so, there's been, especially in British Columbia, a lot of occupations and protests by Indigenous groups. Um, for example, example, protesting the Trans Mountain Pipeline and uh, the really the, the heavy invasion of a lot of Chinese investment, the dislocation of Native people all over the place. And matter of fact, last year, the uh, native groups actually occupied the British Columbia legislature for a number of weeks in protest. So the governments, you know, realized they had to make some gesture. Uh, otherwise, this could blow up into something that they couldn't control. Can you tell us about the challenge of getting the victims to, of the school to actually come out and talk about it? Well, it, it's not only the problem of when you've been traumatized by a horrible experience that isn't just in the past. It's an ongoing crime. I mean, children are often trafficked off, you know, Indian reserves. There's a lot of this continuing genocide going on, as we've documented. So that's the most basic factor. How do you come forward and speak, especially in a country where you're not a citizen under the law? When you're on a reservation under the Indian Act, you're what's known as a ward of the state. You're not even a citizen under the law. You're like a child under the law. So you can be locked away. You can have your rights violated. The law doesn't apply to you if you're a native. Also, their own chiefs have warned them off. Uh, 
from talking about children on the ground. So all of those factors, it's a miracle if anyone comes forward. If people go to murderbydecree.com, you can see some of those voices of people who have come forward. Kevin, thank you so much for joining me once again today. I really appreciate it having you on. Thank you. Stay with us. We'll have more with Kevin Annett coming up after the break.